Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our theme is Knowing the Son. And at this point in the series, we're looking at the Son of God who died on the cross. He did this to fulfill the Father's plan. He was expressing His Sonship by surrendering to the plan of God. And there on the cross, Jesus expresses His Sonship in full Father-facing obedience by surrendering His hands to the nails and His body to be crucified. And it's absolutely amazing when you read the gospel stories to see the events unfold. We know that each and every one of these events were part of the Father's plan to bring him there and how Jesus surrenders to them. He surrenders to the traitor's kiss when Judas betrayed him. He surrenders to the interrogation of the high priest who was trying to trip him up and to trap him in his words. Are you the Son of God? Is this who you really are? And Jesus, like a lamb led to the slaughter, doesn't answer anything but surrenders passively to what was happening because he knew he was obeying the Father. And so we pick up also to have a look at what happened next, the next trial before Pontius Pilate, first the high priest and then the procurator's trial. Jesus triumphs as the Son of God. Now the procurator, Pontius Pilate. The Jewish leaders passed Jesus on to Pontius Pilate with these words, Luke 23 and verse 2. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. These were words that the procurator could not ignore. So they, knew, they were calculated words. They knew exactly what to say to ensure that Pontius Pilate had to take action. And as Pilate investigated this matter, the Gospels make two strong observations. First, they insist that Pilate was so convinced of Jesus' innocence that he declared three times that he could find no ground for charging him. And this personal conviction was confirmed to him by a message from his wife, saying, I've suffered in a dream. You've got to let that man go. Secondly, the gospel stressed that Pilate wanted to avoid coming down on one side or the other. He wanted to avoid sentencing Jesus because he thought he was innocent. But he also wanted to avoid exonerating him completely because he didn't want to upset the Jewish leaders. The gospels describe Pilate wriggling as he tried to be both just and unjust at the same time. First of all, Luke 23 reports that he tried to transfer responsibility to Herod. Oh, Galilee, this is Herod's matter. Off to Herod you go. But this failed. And then Luke shows Pilate tried to satisfy the Jews with something less than the death penalty. Have him scourged, take him back. Next, Mark describes how Pilate hoped that the crowd would select Jesus for the traditional Passover amnesty. It's the custom that I give you a prisoner free at this time of the year. Who would you have? Take Jesus of Nazareth? They said, no, we want Barabbas. Finally, when all his efforts had been exhausted, Matthew 27, verse 24 records, Pilate deviously tried to protect his innocence. Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, Matthew 27, verse 24, but rather that a tumult was rising. He took water, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of this just person. You see to it. Yet even before his hands were dry, Pilate handed Jesus over to die. He was a weak man. Luke stresses that Pilate wanted to release Jesus. Chapter 23 and verse 20. 
Pilate, therefore wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them. But it also says, in Mark 15, verse 15, verse 15 that Pilate wanted to satisfy the crowd. Mark 15, 15, so Pilate wanted to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. In Luke's gospel, we have a threefold repetition to show that the crowd won the struggle over Pilate's will and conscience. Their shouts prevailed. He granted their demands, and he surrendered Jesus to their will. Pilate knew that the son was innocent. He knew that justice demanded his release. But he knew that his career would suffer if justice prevailed. So Pilate silenced his conscience, compromised his convictions, and sent the son to the cross. The soldiers, they carried out Pilate's sentence, and they were perhaps the people most immediately responsible for the son's death, but it's important to note that the actual process of crucifying Jesus is not described by any gospel. They just simply say they crucified him. It seems that the son's words and deeds were far more significant, for it seems as if there is a dignity here that is brought to bear upon the whole proceedings by the Holy Spirit, who records the most horrible words in all of Scripture. There they crucified him. The Gospels do describe the way the soldiers scourged and mocked the son in the procurator's residence. First, they whipped Jesus. This was a scourging. It was not a, a normal beating. It was a Roman scourging when there was leather thongs, many of them, interwoven with bits of metal and bone, whipped. Often people were deformed and crippled, even died from such a whipping. They clothed him in a purple robe, placed a crown of thorns on his head and a scepter of a reed in his hand and knelt in mock homage. They blindfolded him. They spat on him. They slapped him on the face, struck him on the head and challenged him to prophesy, who struck you? Finally, according to the Roman custom, they made the son carry his own cross to the place of execution, weakened by the nightly trial and all of the beating and the abuse, the weight was too much for him, and Jesus stumbled. A man called Simon from Cyrene in North Africa was then pressed into carrying the cross for Jesus. When they arrived at Golgotha, the soldiers offered Jesus some wine mixed with myrrh to dull the pain, but Jesus refused to drink it. Then there are no more details. The Gospels do not mention the hammer and the nails, nor do they refer to the pain or blood. They merely state they crucified him. The Gospels don't suggest that the soldiers were especially cruel or enjoyed this task. They were simply obeying orders. They executed three criminals that day, according to them. But according to Luke, Jesus prayed aloud during this ordeal and made an impact upon the participants. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. One of the crucified criminals believed. One of the centurions in charge of the soldiers believes. So while the sun hung on the cross, the soldiers gambled for his clothes. Some women watched from afar, the Jewish leaders and rulers sneered. Jesus cannot save himself. The Gospels report that Jesus lovingly commended his mother to John's care and John to hers. Then he reassured the penitent thief, who 
who is dying by his side. You're going to be with me in paradise this very day. At noon, darkness comes to Golgotha for three hours. The Gospels don't tell us what happened to the sun during this time. Elsewhere, however, the Scriptures reveal what had happened. We find that the glory of God is here. And then there comes a cry of forsakenness. Some people suggest that the darkness symbolized a spiritual darkness which engulfed the sun and climaxed in the cry of forsakenness. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They maintain that darkness represents the idea of separation from God who is so light that it contains no darkness. Others suggest the opposite. They believe that God was present at the sacrifice in the form of the dark cloud, just as it often revealed himself in a cloud at the hour of sacrifice in Old Testament times, because it was when the darkness ended that the words were cried out from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some listeners misunderstood him. Eli, Eli, laba sabachthani. They thought he was calling out to Eli, Elijah. Although it's plain that Jesus was quoting Psalm 22 and verse 1. People today still wonder what his cry meant. Some suggest it was a cry of despair. Others consider it a cry of loneliness or a cry of victory. The cry of victory came later. This was a straightforward cry of genuine forsakenness. Why have you forsaken me? My God! My God! Where are you? Some people say, but surely, logically, Jesus would have understood that. But don't forget, at that moment, Jesus was carrying the sin of the world upon his shoulders. He was carrying the sin of the world, the sinless Son of God. And this suggests to me that nothing that Jesus had anticipated as he had heard the Father's voice in the Scriptures, in his circumstances, and in his own inner spirit, nothing had prepared him for the full horrors of the cross. It took him by surprise. That shows us what an awful thing it was. Until the cross, though forsaken even by his closest apostles, the Son knew the Father had been with him. Now on the cross at this moment, he was literally, utterly forsaken. Even his Father forsook him. And if you have been listening, to this series and following closely, you would by now know what an awful, awful, unthinkable, unimaginable horror that would be for the Son, who had never in all eternity so much has allowed a flickering thought of rebellion or rejection to come into his heart, mind, who was always at the Father's side in face-to-face -face communion, who had always been utterly, totally submissive, obedient, and dependent upon the Father. He had come willingly to this earth, leaving aside the glorious manifestation in the Father's presence never once seeking to grasp attainment for his own purposes or his own ends. He lived as a servant on this earth. He washed the disciples' feet. He ministered to the poor. He touched people's lives. He took the physical beating. He allowed his hands to be pierced. He allowed his head to be crowned with thorns on the cross, all in obedience to the Father's will. He had never for one moment flinched from obeying the Father and always knowing the Father's love and intimacy by being in very nature the Son of God. 
always in perfect, intimate unity with the Father. Always knowing the Father's warmth. Always knowing the Father's embrace. Now, even the Father has left him. Oh yes, on the cross, an actual separation took place between the Father and the Son. It was freely accepted by both the Father and the Son, but it was due entirely to your sin and my sin. So when Jesus expresses this Father forsakenness by quoting the only verse in Scripture which accurately describes it, which he had perfectly fulfilled, let none of us, none of us, Say, why did he do that? He experienced something that no one will ever understand. But in that separation, that brief separation of God the Father, God the Son, I see it like the atom. That which is indissolvable splits. And from that separation comes an explosion of God's love. And the fallout is with us today. That's why we're here. Then on the cross we see these cries of thirst. The cry of victory and the cry of commitment. And they happen in very quick succession. Here they are. I thirst. It is finished. And Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. His cry of thirst appears to express the toll that this great spiritual suffering has taken on him physically. His cry of victory expresses the finality or full completion of the, of the task. The Greek word here is tetelestai. In the perfect tense it means it has been and it will be forever finished. The son had completed his redeeming rescue mission. He had accomplished what he'd come into the world to do. He had borne the sins of the world. He had endured the wrath of God. He had achieved salvation for the whole world. He'd given birth to new life and had established a new covenant between God and humanity and made available the blessing of forgiveness. Let's applaud the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. It is finished. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory. And so, his cry of commitment that followed showed that the son was in full control. He did not die because he was killed by sinful men. He died because he freely commended his spirit into the Father's hands. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I dismiss my spirit. He didn't, his life wasn't taken from him. He gave it. The nails on the cross put him there. But it was his own willing submission and obedience to the Father that said, here's my life. And at once, the temple curtain, which symbolized separation of sinners from God, was torn in two from the top to the bottom to demonstrate that the sin barrier had been thrown down by God and the way into his presence is open to us all. Religion tries to tear that from the bottom upwards. It never, it doesn't tear from the bottom upwards. Only God can do it. It tears from the top down. This is about God coming down. This is about Jesus coming from the Father. This is about the glory of God touching our lives. This is about the salvation that God achieves on our behalf. And then, 36 hours later, the Father raised the Son from the dead and publicly vindicated him in the resurrection. This was God's decisive demonstration that the death of Jesus on the cross had not been in vain. So we come to the truth of the cross. In Salvation by Grace, in that series, we explain why Jesus 
attach so much importance to his death on the cross? Why he instituted his memorial meal to commemorate it? And why God honored it with a new covenant and resurrection glory? When we fully grasp the greatness of God's eternal plan of salvation, when we appreciate its foreshadowings in the Old Testament and its consummation on the last day, we can begin to understand the son's agony of anticipation in Gethsemane, his anguish of forsakenness on the cross, and his triumphant claim to have fully accomplished our eternal salvation. When we start to think more deeply about the son and the cross, we begin to glimpse three great truths about the cross. First, we start to realize just how terrible our own sin must be. For nothing reveals the seriousness of human sin quite like the cross of Calvary. Ultimately, the son was not sent to the cross by Judas's greed, or by the priest's envy, or by Pilate's moral cowardness, but our greed, our envy, our cowardness, and all our other sins. And also by his loving determination to bear their judgment and so to remove these sins completely. It's really not possible for us to look at the drama of the cross without feeling real shame at our personal complicity. We were compliant. We were there. We pointed the nails. We fixed the crown. We crucified Jesus. There's no other way really in which God could have righteously forgiven our sin except by bearing it himself in the cross through his Son. And if that's the case, then our sin must have been very serious indeed. Once people begin to grasp this, then they must be ready to trust the Son and Son alone as the Savior that we all so desperately need. The cross brings a revelation of our sin. It also brings a revelation of His love. God's love must be so great that it's beyond all human comprehension. The Father could have abandoned humanity to its fate. He could have said, you've had your chance. I gave you the chance and you've, and you've blown it. And the Father was not obliged to save anybody. He could have left us to reap the fruit of our sin and perish in our wickedness. He would have been just as much God by doing that. That's what we deserve, and it's often what we want. Leave us alone, Lord. But God didn't act like this because He loves us. He came after us in Christ. He pursues us to the anguish of the cross where He lovingly bore our sin and our guilt, and our judgment, and even our death. It's surely not possible to look at the motivating love of the cross and to remain unmoved. If you can be unmoved in the presence of the cross, then you are a hard stone indeed. When people start to appreciate this truth, they're eager to love the Son as the Lord whom they need so much. Then thirdly, the cross demonstrates for us Free grace. Salvation must be a free gift or it just doesn't happen. As the cross shows that the Son purchased our salvation fully by His blood, there can be therefore nothing left for us to pay. And as He claimed that the task was finished on the cross, there can be nothing left for us to do. It's all of God. It's all grace. And if it is not all grace then it's not the salvation of the Bible. If there is one thing that we do to contribute to our salvation, then it's not the salvation of this book. It's a man-made religion. But it is all of grace. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now we can't quote that because it doesn't apply to us. 
It applies to those who were alive when Jesus died. While we were yet sinners, Christ died. Paul might have been thinking, maybe there was something about his own life that he knew that we don't know. Maybe he knew where he was when Jesus died. Like people all over the world who can remember it say, where were you when President Kennedy died? Where were you, Paul, when Jesus died? We don't know. He could have been in any one of a number of places. Certainly, he was a hard-hearted religious Pharisee who had no grace in his life. But while he was a sinner, Jesus was dying. We can't say that. We have to say, God shows his love to us, his own love to us in this. Before we were even born, before we'd even done anything good or bad, before we'd come into this world, even before that, Christ died for the ungodly, the just, for the unjust, to bring us for God. And if, even before we were born, the solution for our salvation and the price for it was paid, what amazing love, what great grace. And all we can do is receive it and bow before the presence of this God and desire with everything in us, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that we should live in open recognition of the great glory of God that made it all possible. And surely the most grateful thing we could ever do is to say, Jesus, thank you, and I want to know you, and I want to follow you, and I want to give you everything. You gave me everything. Now I give you everything. That's the drama of the cross. And it's the high point of the Gospels. But there is one more thing that we must come back to deal with. And that is that this one who lived and died and was raised again, went to be with the Father, he's coming back. And that's what we're going to come back to do. Have a look at the second coming of Jesus in the very next session. God bless you. And that brings to an end today's teaching on knowing the Son. And I pray that throughout these programs, God will give you greater and greater revelation concerning Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We'll be back next time with more teaching on knowing the Son. Mm -hmm.